Hello, my name is uh, Paul Beckwith, and in this video, I'm going to discuss a very, very interesting paper called Economics for the Future Beyond the Superorganism. So the superorganism is, it's not humans, but it's humans and our infrastructure, our society, our civilizations, everything that we do on this planet. And uh, this paper is in the journal Ecological Economics, and the author is Nate Hagens, and he's with the Institute for the Study of Energy and Our Future. And, you know, lots of people these days, even mainstream um, articles, etc., are talking about sort of the end game, or uh, they're talking about a collapse of organized society that we have today, and you know, what, what's next beyond that? I mean, of course, doomers think that there's nothing beyond that. Many people think there's egalitarian or, um, <clears throat> you know, other societies coming out of the, the end of, of, the, of the present system. But basically, it doesn't matter who you talk to and what ideas they have. There, there's some hard physical truths. And one of these hard physical truths is the energy question. We do not have enough energy to keep our, our, to sustain the path that we're on. Um, energy, fossil fuel energy, it's like, it's like um, we broke into the cookie jar and, you know, we've had great success for 150 years, but we're, we've run out of cookies, essentially, or we're running, we're almost out of cookies. And, uh, you know, if you think of fossil fuels, the energy um, in a barrel of oil is 1,700 kilowatt hours. You know, a healthy, fit human can do about 0 0.6 kilowatt hours of, can expend that energy or put out that energy in a day's work. Divide those two numbers, we're talking 11 years. So a barrel of oil, essentially replaces the work of a manual laborer, um, 11 years worth of work of a manual labor laborer. So you can see that, you know, why our society with access by mining up the fossil fuels, why we rely so much on them completely and utterly. But part of the equation is the burning of carbon and the um, increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and this is the whole climate predicament or climate catastrophe that we're, we're seeing right now. So the system is breaking, you know, what's beyond the end of it? This paper tries to have a look, but it looks at the history, it looks at human psychology, um, it looks at a lot of different factors. So um, I'm going to uh, point out these. This is, this is an open source paper, um, and it was published thought it was 2020, but I believe it's 20, 2019. Okay, so it's pre-pandemic, so keep that in mind as we go through. So the I'll talk a bit more, a bit about Nate Hagen's um, when I get through this paper. But basically, um, our environment and economy are at a crossroads. So the paper attempts a cohesive narrative based on how human evolved behavior, money, energy, economy, and the environment all fit together. In a resource-rich environment, humans coordinate in groups, corp corporations, and nations to maximize financial surplus. And this is tethered to energy, which is tethered to carbon, burning carbon. At global scales, the emergent result of this combination of our individual human actions. It's a mindless, energy-hungry, CO2-emitting superorganism. Using this dynamic, we are now behaviorally growth-constrained. We'll, we will, uh, humans will use any means possible to avoid facing this reality. The further we kick the can down the road, the larger the disconnect between our financial and physical reality becomes because we're kicking the can down the road by creating debt, by just printing money, nothing to back it up. And this debt has grow, been growing faster and faster than the GDP even. 
And um, this is a problem, it's a huge problem. So when the whole system recalibrates, if you like, it's gonna be a watershed time for humanity, for our culture, but it could also be the birth of a new systems economics and different ways of living. Okay, we, we need to have this species level conversation. Okay, so basically ecological e economics, it addresses the relationship between ecosystems, of course, ecological systems and economic systems in the broadest sense. This was the first sentence in the first article in the first issue of ecological economics. The real, I love this quote by E.O. Wilson, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology. And uh, I like the phrase, uh, we're, we're addicted to the present, basically. And here's another quote. We live in a world where there is more and more information and less and less meaning. And then another one, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So we need to face the energy, the coming energy crunch, if you like. Okay, so just an overview. We've had decades of warnings, agreements, and activism, lots of COPs. You know, we just had COP 27, the 27th Conference of Parties. Goes back to, you know, uh, goes back a long period of time. Um, human energy consumption, emissions, and atmospheric CO2 concentrations, they all, they're all hitting new records. Now, this paper was published in 2019, but this has continued um, to, to present. There was a little back off the first year of the pandemic, but it's pretty much back up to where it was. If the global economy continues to grow at its rate, present rate of about 3% per year, we'll consume as much energy and materials in the next 30 years as we did cumulatively in the past 10,000 years since, the, since uh, you know, for the whole duration of the Holocene. We get daily reminders the global economy isn't working like it used to, like rising wealth and income inequality. You know, three or four of the top billionaires um, could could pay for the entire U.S. military budget. You know, that 800 billion, which it is, you know, which it is in, for 2023. There is heavy reliance on debt and government guarantees. There's populist political movements, increasing apathy, tension and violence and ecological decay. We're now obtaining growth in increasingly unsustainable ways. The developed world is using finance to enable the extraction of things we couldn't otherwise afford to extract and produce things we otherwise couldn't afford to consume. So there you go. We're in these vicious feedback cycles. Okay, so we need a hard look at the relationships between ecosystems and economic systems. And what does it say about our collective future? Ecological e economics, and, and Stuart Scott talked a lot about this. It was ahead of its time in recognizing the fundamental importance of nature services and the biophysical underpinnings of human economies. So we also, we now we need to construct a blueprint for a reconstruction because we're going, we're energy constrained. But first we need a diagnosis of the patient and maybe a bit of history. So we need a systems view. We need a coherent description of the global economy needs a systems view describing the parts, the processes and how the parts and processes interact with each other what these interactions imply about future possibilities and how these interactions change. And this is uh, the important things are human behavior, of course, the economy and Earth's environment. Okay, um, we're a so very highly social species. Self-organizing around surplus has meta metabolically morphed us into a single mindless energy hungry super organism humans and our, everything we do, our societies. Okay, so there's a bit of history. So most of the past 300,000 years when, when Homo sapiens sapiens um, evolved, we've lived in a sustainable egalitarian, so everybody's equal 
roaming bands where climate instability and low CO2 levels made success in agriculture unlikely. Peak of the last ice age was 21,000 years, but 11,000 years ago, the climate began to warm. This is called the Holocene period, eventually plateauing at warmer levels in the previous 100,000 years. So this allowed agriculture to develop in at least seven separate locations around the world independently. Okay, that's what the current thinking is. Before we thought it all originated in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East and then spread to other regions, but it developed in at least seven separate locations about the same time. For the first time, groups of humans began to organize around physical surplus. Production exceeded the group's immediate caloric needs. Since some of the population no longer had to devote their time to hunting and gathering, they could become, there were new jobs created, new hierarchies, new ways of organizing society, increasing complexity. This novel dynamic led to widespread agriculture and large scale uh, state societies over the next few thousand years. So this is a temperature of the Greenland ice surface you know, minus, fluctuating from about minus 55 to minus 35 or so. And then in the Holocene, here we go. Now it's hovering about minus 30. Okay, very, very warm period. Okay. So, um, of course, in the 19th century, we discovered fossil carbon. So, and we started inventing all kinds of technologies to use it. Fossil carbon provided humans with an extremely dense but finite source of energy extractable at a rate of our choosing, unlike the highly diffuse and fixed flow of sunlight of prior eras. The energy bounty enabled the 20th century to be a unique period in human history. So 1900 to 2000, more and cheaper resources led to sharp productivity increases, unprecedented economic growth, a debt-based financial system cut free from physical tethers, no longer, you know, you could just print money and create debt. You didn't have to have anything to back it up in, in vaults, like no gold in vaults, for example. Um, so consumption accelerated, credit accelerated, consumption accelerated. This all fueled resource surpluses, uh, enabling diverse and richer societies. But we're, we've di we're diverging from this trajectory, okay? This is a hard reality. Energy and resources are be again becoming constraining factors on economic and societal development. Physical expansion predicated on credit is becoming riskier and will hit a limit. Societies are becoming polarized, losing trust in governments, media, and science, looking for scapegoats. Ecosystems are being degraded as they absorb large quantities of energy and material waste from human systems. Where do we go from here? Well, human be behavior is a big component. Like humans are unique. We're unique just the same way that tree frogs and hippos are unique. So uniqueness is, you know, applies to just about every species. You know, we're still mammals, primates, but you know, our physical characteristics like the sclera, the white part of the eyes, the small mouth, the lack of canines, these are the products of our formative social past in small bands. But our brains and behaviors are products of what worked in the past. We don't consciously go through life maximizing biological fitness, but instead we act as adaptation executors, seeking to replicate the daily emotional states of our successful ancestors. We have an impressive ability to process information, cooperate and discover things. This has brought us to a state of organization and wealth that we experience today. But our stone age minds are responding to modern technology, resource abundance, and large fluid social groups in emergent ways. Okay, we're a very social species. As biological organisms, we care about relative status, not absolute status so much. Historically, status was linked to providing resources for the clan, like leadership, respect, storytelling, ethics, sharing, and community. In modern culture, we compete for status with cars, homes, vacations, gadgets, using money as an intermediary driver. Intermediary, intermediary driver. Although most of the poorest 20% in advanced economies live materially richer than the middle class in the 1900s, one's income rank 
as opposed to the absolute income, is what predicts life's satisfaction. For those who don't win, a lack of perceived status leads to depression, drinking, stockpiling of guns, and other adverse behavior. Once basic needs are satisfied, we are primed to respond to the comparison of better versus worse more than we do to a, a little versus a lot. Okay, we've got huge stimuli and addictions. Okay, uh, in our ancestral environment, the brain, the mesolimbic dopamine pathways were linked to motivation, action, and calorific reward. But modern tech and abundance has hijacked this reward circuitry. The brain of a stock trader making a winning trade lights up a functional MRI, the same way a chimpanzee's does when finding a nut or berry. But when you're trading stocks, there's no stop signal. There's no instinctual full signal like there is if you're eating a nut or a berry you eat it you get full it, it you don't have the desire to have it but there's no stop there's there's no there's nothing that says we're full when you're trading stocks you just keep going and keep going and keep going we're addicted to the unexpected reward of the next encounter episode or email at an ever increasing pace our brains require flows feelings that we satisfy today mostly using non-renewable stocks and in, in modern resource rich culture the wanting of something becomes a stronger emotion than the having so if you have something you have a gorgeous car or, you know you have a lamborghini quintash or something you get bored with it after a while it's what the wanting is is what we're addicted to it it fuels us you want more and more and more there's never enough we also have many cognitive biases. We don't have a clear view of the world. We think we do, but um, our, there's beliefs and uh, beliefs, uh, you know, that arise from this virtual interface. Like the, you know, we think in words and images as opposed to rea the reality. Um, so thinking in this interface, it be, you know, whether we think of things like religion, nationalism, goals such as terraforming Mars, etc. We have these, um, but we have, there's a lot of myths and fail. If you don't believe in these myths, you get ostracized and people that are ostracized from society um, tended to die, would, would die in the past. And now I guess they just find a different group on, on the web or whatever. The reason beliefs usually precede the reasons we use to explain them. And those are far more powerful than facts. So. We believe something and then we search out reasons to justify our beliefs. Um, and with the, the joy of the internet, you can search out and find the craziest things to craziest um, sources to support whatever you think, however unconnected to reality it might be. So there's hundreds of these cognitive biases that make human behaviors depart from economic rationality. For example, motivated reasoning, groupthink, authority bias, bystander effect, etc. The rational part of our brain is a newer part of our brain. It evolved later. You know, it's, uh, it's still dominated by the more primitive, intuitive, and emotional brain structures of the limbic system. Modern economics assumes the rational brain is in charge, but it's not. Combined with our tribal in-group nature, it's understandable that fake news works. People resist uncomfortable notions involving limits to growth, energy descent, and climate change. Evolution selects for fitness, not truth. We typically value truth if it rewards us in the short term. Rationality is the exception, not the rule. Now, of course, there's a huge time bias. For good evolutionary reasons, such as short lifespans, risk of food expropriation, unstable environment, we disproportionately care about the present more than the future. This is measured by economists by a discount rate. The higher the discount rate, the more the person is addicted to the present. We're definitely addicted to the present. Like for, think, for example, drug users and drinkers, risk takers, people with low IQ scores, people who have heavy cognitive workloads, men versus women. We steeply discount events and issues in the future. But unfortunately, most of our modern challenges are in the future. Recognition that the future exists and that we are part of it springs from a relatively new brain structure called the neocortex. There's no direct connection 
of the neocortex to deep brain motivational centers that communicate urgency. And this is a great example. Let's say we're asked to plan a snack for next week and we can choose between chocolate and fruit. 75% of the people choose fruit. If we're choosing a snack for today, 70% select chocolate. Let's say we're choosing a movie to watch for next week. 63% choose an educational documentary, but if we're choosing a film for tonight, 66% choose a comedy or sci-fi. Yeah, we're, 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 we're fooling ourselves all the time. We have great intentions for the future until the future becomes today. Our neocortex can't imagine them, but we are emotionally blind to long-term issues like climate change or energy de depletion. So emotionally, on an emotional basis, the future isn't real. Everything is now, 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 every, right? Now, group behavior has shaped us as much as individual behavior. We're strongly groupish. And before agriculture, we were aggressively egalitarian, all equal fair to each other. These historic tribes could act as a cohesive unit facing a common threat, out-competed tribes without the social cohesion. Thus we formed, today we form in-groups and out-groups. We behave favor favorably in the in-groups, antagonistically toward the out-groups. We're primed to cooperate with our in-group, whether that is a small business, large corporation, or even a nation state. This is a tribalism idea to obtain monetary or in earlier times, physical surplus. It's me over us, us over them, okay, is, is the idea. So, um, you know, cultural evolution, ultra sociability and the super organism, those are some key points. So basically, um, two cultural experiments running in isolation for 15,000 years or more, at last came face to face in the early 1500s. Okay, this is when Cortez landed in Mexico. He found roads, canals, cities, palaces, schools, law courts, markets, irrigation works, kings, priests, temples, peasants, artisans, armies, astronomers, merchants, sports, theater, art, music, and books. High civilization. So differing, it differs in detail, but it was alike in essentials, had evolved independently on both sides of the earth, okay? Mexico versus uh, Europe, Spain in, in, for the case of Cortez, right? So basically the Europeans on one side, the uh, Mexico, South America, you know, two different civilizations evolved completely. And then if we know what happened, the one was conquered by the other. People are ultra social. This refers to the most social of animal organizations. There's full divi time division of labor, specialists who gather no food but are fed by others, effective sharing of information about sources of food in danger, self-sacrificial effort in collective defense. So humans, we're only among a small handful of species that are extremely social. We're, we're primates, but behaviorally, we're more like ants, the social insects, or bees. Our ultra so social, social, ultra social behavior allows us to function at much larger scales and as individuals at the largest scales, cultural evolution occurs far more rapidly than genetic evolution. Why the cultural evolution that began with agriculture, we evolved into a globally interconnected civilization, out competing other human economic models along the way to become a de facto super organism. This is a collection of agents which can act in concert to produce phenomena governed by the collective. Okay. The needs of this higher level entity, the super organism, right? For humans, it's the global economy. This molds behavior, organization, and functions of lower level entities, like in, including individual human behavior. Those were constrained and modified by downward causation from the higher level of organization present in society. All the, ration, all the irrationalities previously outlined have kept our species flourishing for 300,000 years. So it's worked. What has changed is not us, but rather the economic organization of our societies in tandem with technology, scale, and impact. 
Since the Neolithic, human society has organized around growth of surplus, initially measured physically, for example, e.g. grain, now measured by digital claims on physical surplus or money. Cooperation, things like that have been co-opted to become coordination towards surplus production. Increasing the purpose, uh, increasingly, the purpose of a modern human in the ultra-social global economy is to contribute to surplus of market. So human behavior, um, you know, who we are, it all gets to that. Now, energy, we need to, ecological economics acknowledges that real economies are completely dependent on energy. Regular or orthodox economic theory remains blind to this reality. Okay, um, so our institutions and our citizens are also blind to this reality of co our complete dependence on energy. Energy is and always has been and always will be the currency of life. The effectiveness of energy capture is central to biological systems. Any movement, any activity or event in nature requires energy. Organisms utilize foraging strategies that optimize energy intake versus energy expenditure adjusted for time and risk. So biological organisms are investors. A large energy surplus gives an organism a competitive advantage for growth, reproduction, defense, competition, maintenance, and repair. Okay, so but it, it's and biological systems maximize power. Metabolism is the rate at which organisms acquire, transform, and expend energy and materials. Power is the energy per unit time. Ecosystems and organisms structure themselves to maximize power by accessing the energy gradients. Like an oak tree doesn't grow one leaf, that would be maximum efficiency, or 100,000 leaves, that would be maximum gross energy, but it has an intermediate amount of leaves that maximizes the surface area of the tree to the sun for photosynthesis. Okay, systems which maximize useful power generally outcompete those which do not. Now, now I'm going to get into energy, and I'm going to use this example that's in the paper of milking hand milking, parlor milking, automated milking. But before, let's talk about energy. So the major transitions in human societies over the past 10,000 years were linked to the benefits from different energy types and availability. Industrialization changed the historic human relationships of energy capture from the daily flows of energy to using technology fueled by large amounts of cheap fossil energy. Now, this is the crux of the whole thing. One barrel of crude oil can perform about 1,700 kilowatt hours of work. A human laborer can perform about 0 0.6 kilowatt hours in one workday. So it takes 11 years of human labor to do the same work potential as a barrel of oil. Even if we became much more efficient, say by 2.5 times, it would still take four and a half years of human labor to match one barrel of oil in terms of energy content. So this is the foundation of the Industrial Revolution. Most technological processes require hundreds to thousands of calories of fossil energy to replace each human calorie previously used. So the, now the milking the cow example. There's three methods. One is manual, which is human labor only. Second is uh, semi-electric milking machines, 1100 kilowatt hour per cow per year. And the third is fully automated milking with 3000 kilowatt hours per cow year. The manual milker working alone requires 120 hours of human labor per year per cow. Semi-automatic machines, 27 hours. Full automation, 12 hours. If you estimate that the human milker generates an economic value of five bucks an hour, the electric milkers would be much higher than that, $19 per hour. And the semi uh, with semi-automated milkers and 25 bucks per hour with fully automated. But of course, this large economic benefit goes to primarily the owner of the dairy farm. So that one person becomes much, much richer, but earns way more than other people that are involved in the process. And this leads to huge income inequality. Consumers get cheaper milk. OK, so this is the same principle extrapolates to most modern industrial processes. We save human labor and time by adding large amounts of cheap fossil labor. So you can see here the human milker, um, and this is if the the cost of energy is varied, okay? So, you know, it's all human energy. 
And then parlor milking with semi-automated, uh, much higher output, more energy going in, 100 times more energy to go in, like 180 humans working versus one because of fossil fuels, and now 400 times with automated milking. If the price of energy is low, you get a huge gain. But if the price of energy goes up, then the automated thing breaks down. This is exactly what's happening in our society. Okay. Modern industrial output is energy inefficient. It's extremely cost effective because fossil energy is much cheaper than human energy. This is the fossil subsidy that makes modern profits, wages, and standards of living considerably higher compared to previous civilizations based on diffuse renewable flows and human labor. The average human in 2015 produced 14 times more GDP than a person in 1800, the average American 49 times more. Modern Americans, via their energy subsidy, now have the physical meta metabolism of 30 plus ton primates. There you go. Okay, but when energy costs go up, the whole system breaks down, and this is what is happening. This is what is happening. In 2018, the global economy ran on a constant 17 trillion watts of energy. Okay, uh, if you have 100 watt light bulbs, that's 170 billion 100 watt light bulbs. 80% of this energy was 110 billion barrels of oil equivalents of fossil hy hydrocarbons that power and are embodied, embodied in our machines, transportation, and infrastructure. At 4.5 years per barrel, if it was all human labor, this equates to a labor equivalent of more than 500 billion human workers compared to 4 billion actual human workers. So there's about 8 billion on the planet now. Remember, this was back a, few, a couple of years ago. There were 4 billion actual human workers, roughly, in 2019. Um, but because of our fossil fuel usage, it was like we had 500 billion human workers. See the leveraging from fossil fuels? See why fossil fuels are predominant? See why it's so hard to get rid of them? But there's, you know, the they're, they're, we're burning them and they're make, we're burning the, and, and the carbon's going into our system, changing our, our climate. Okay, so, you know, energy substitutability. Modern economic theory considers all inputs fungible and substitutable. If the price of one input gets too high, the market will develop an alternative. However, energy does not cooperate with this theory because different sources of energy exhibit critical differences in quality, density, storability, surplus, transportability, environmental impact, and other factors. Okay, uh, there's hundreds of medium and high heat industrial processes like for textiles, chemicals, cement, steel. They use fossil fuels that have no current alternative using low carbon technology. Okay, so modern economic theory it just assumes the energy is going to be there. You know, it's going to be replaced. And this is completely hokey, complete nonsense. Energy is fundamental. It sets the physical limits to our social scale. All life, commerce, work, or creation of energy is enabled and limited by available net energy. As GDP increases globally, energy needs to increase in lockstep. Until the 1970s, it was perfectly correlated. A 5% increase in GDP needed a 5% rise in energy consumption. Here is the world uh, energy consumption and mix. Um, and... Uh, you know, this is uh, approaching, this is over 15, uh, this is megatons of, uh, so it's, uh, it goes back to here, 17 trillion watts of energy, okay, so. So here's how the energy is, uh, this is uh, world GDP, it's the black line. And then we have biomass, we have coal, oil, natural gas, hydro, nuclear, other renewables. And you can see, you know, the renewables has grown, uh, nuclear about the same, but all of these, you know, we're, we're producing more, but the bulk is still fossil fuels and it's still growing and we're still getting burning more and more carbon and having record levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, so, So energy is still, it's just treated as another input into our economic system, which is absurd. 
This is in spite of the fact that energy is needed to create and transform all material inputs and energy can only be substituted by other energy. Okay, so um, let's uh, move on. Um, energy is a major factor. It's not an insignificant factor. Um, they quoted, uh, this is a paper by Tom Garrett. Primary energy consumption is tied to accumulated global wealth by an energy constant of 9.7 plus or minus 0 0.3 milliwatts per 1990 US dollar. Okay, so you can look at, uh, let's get, okay, so prior to the industrial age, all re relevant econ economic theorists, including Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and others, use land and land productivity to describe the human ecosystem. As the global economy expanded with increasing subsidy from fossil energy, land productivity and physical input constraints were considered unnecessary and eventually removed from economic theory. By the time of the first energy crisis in the 1970s, macroeconomic descriptions had been reduced to labor and capital. That's it, labor and capital for growth, you know, and human creativity. So this was, a, we created an infinite growth model on a finite planet, right? It was just economists view capital, labor, and human creativity as primary and energy secondary or absence. The opposite is in fact true. We are energy blind. And of course, energy and technology, you know, as we get more and more sort of energy, we have more and more technology. Type one technology finds ways to use energy more efficiently, like power plant improvements, better fuel, efficiency for your cars, or it invents new energy sources, solar or geothermal. Type two technology is devices that replace manual human labor, chainsaw cars, etc., or new ways for humans to use energy, Facebook Candy Crush, think uh, cryptocurrencies. Type two dominates tech, and increases total global demand for energy. And that's exactly what we're doing. Like the cloud is not virtual. Computers and cell phones, they consume over 15% of the world's electricity. And that will increase, uh, that's increasing with 5G. Technology is an expression of the available energy we can exploit. What we call technological process, progress at any time is the development of things that use higher and higher energy. With growing GDP as a global goal, extra energy allows for more inventions that in turn make our economy more complex, resulting in an energy complexity spiral. Like here, here's better technology in the US. <clears throat> here's US oil production peaked in the 70s, dropped significantly, and then surpassed a peak. Why? Well, here's conventional oil. This is Alaska development. This is offshore oil. And look at tight oil, like oil from rock, fracked oil. Okay, and when you make uh, the tight oil, you know, uh, when you get ex you can extract it from a given site for about two or three years, then you have to go drill, drill, uh, drill another hole and find it. So it's very, very tough to, to maintain this sort of thing. So, so you know, how did the energy get in the fossil fuels? Well, it was from photosynthesis as a trickle charge. Hundreds of millions of years of living biomass were stored as hydrocarbons in Earth's battery. And now we're drawing down this carbon battery 10 million times faster than it was charged. Estimates of remaining oil and natural gas vary wildly, wild, widely, but the cheap, high quality oil at scale has largely been found and exploited, right? All the low hanging fruit is gone. You know, the tight oil is in source rock and it's very quickly depleted by as much as 90% in the first three years. Okay, uh, yeah, so it's becoming harder and harder, but we, we're drilling more and more holes based on credit. Um, and uh, it's not just, oil, you know, energy, but it's the commodities like copper is a key industrial commodity. You know, Chile is one of the big uh, producers of copper and uh, more and more energy gets put in and you get less and less out. There's also water, lithium and food. We use about two calories of fossil fuel to grow one food calorie in our modern agricultural system, but we use eight to 12 additional calories to process, package, deliver, store, and cook modern food. So we're eating fossil fuels basically as well, right? That's not sustainable. And then it goes into, so this is chili. This is more and more um, energy consumption, and this is the production of copper. 
uh, over the years. So some variation, but we're putting more and more energy in to extract it. This is what debt is doing, our financial systems. If this is an oil field production with no debt, you get debt and cr you credit more and more debt, and then you can have better methods, more technologies. You can increase the peak and extend it, but you still get get the uh, face the, rea the reality of the collapse. Now, so energy, money is a claim on energy. Debt is a claim on future energy. Business schools teach that debt is neutral to the capital structure. It's an in intertemporal transfer of consumption on preference. GDP generated with debt or with cash is considered equivalent. But of course, you know, that's absurd. Every single year since 1965, both the USA and the world have grown debt more than GDP. Okay, so debt is more accurately an intertemporal transfer of consumption. Okay, it's a social construct, and this is the human development index with the energy. So, so basically, you know, as you increase energy, you get hum, human development index increases, but then it plateaus above a certain point. Um, so soaring GDP is directly linked to soaring burning of, of fossil hydrocarbons, which is linked to soaring amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. Society doesn't yet recognize these links because we conflate the dollar cost of energy extraction tiny with the work value huge. Energy is only substitutable with other similar quality energy. The advanced technology is achieved with energy. Most technological advances increase future energy requirements. Look at, look at crypto, for example, the amount of energy it uses. We can, for now, readily print money, but we can't print energy to give it value. Okay, so basically the externalities are really starting to kill us. Um, you know, we're seeing negative impacts, topsoil loss, endocrine disrupting chemicals, declining sperm counts, mounting inequality, water shortages, um, declining medium incomes, populism, depression, worry about the future, geopolitical risk, negative impacts to the natural world from CO2, ecosystem uh, decline, biodiversity decline, ocean acidification, coral loss, deforestation, you know, all these different things, which you guys probably know about. Okay, so this is uh, the non-renewable resource. This is the money that we put in, and this is what we could sustain. Sustainable is much, much lower. Um, and, you know, if you look at, you know, us as a super organism, um, we're... Here we go. What began some 11,000 years ago is hunter-gatherers cooperating to obtain physical surplus from land. It's morphed into a globally connected human culture, maximizing financial representations of physical surplus. In pursuit of economic growth, modern human culture appears as a self-organized, mindless, energy-seeking superorganism, functioning in similar ways to a brainless amoeba using simple trophisms, but how and why? Let's look at starlings, okay? Remember this, this, the birds? If they follow rules, do what your neighbor does. Don't get too close to another starling. Fly towards the center. Then you get these murmuration patterns. Just Google it on YouTube. Watch some of the wonderful patterns. Tens of thousands of starlings. They're just following these simple rules, but you get a beautiful murmuration in the sky, which is an emergent result, not predicted by the bi biology or behavior of the individual bird. Well, that's what we're doing. Only our murmuration is our super organism. So most modern humans as individuals, we follow three simple rules. Execute optimal foraging algorithms, coordinate with other humans, families, small businesses, corporations, nations towards acquiring financial surplus, pursue culturally condoned behaviors, spend the financial surplus on comfortable, fun things or experiences, as long as they're culturally acceptable. This is the, the emergent property of the seven, of eight billion people now going through their daily lives is a super organism with a 17 terawatt metabolism. You know, and gross domestic product, always trying to get growth, growth, growth. Um, there, there is basically uh, biological scaling laws. They follow the natural emergent outgrowth of networks. So. Um, you know, in animals, we have a blood circulatory network. It trans 
towards hemoglobin throughout the volume of the organism. The energy metabolism is proportional to the mass to the three quarter power. The flow of petroleum in modern economies is linked to the flow of blood in mammals, with the veins and arteries being the global air, sea, and road transportation nodes. Virtually all human infrastructure, gas stations, surface area roads, etc., these things scale using similar biological relationships. Okay, connections, veins and bodies, social media, telephones, or highways, these scale at roughly one half of the number of nodes squared by node squared. Each of these nodes requires energy to maintain, new nodes to connect. You know, so modern human society, we can be viewed as a macro organism whose energy metabolism increases the size of the global GDP to the three quarter power. Okay, uh, so we can't get absolute decoupling of, of our society of GDP from energy consumption. We can get relative decoupling, but we can't get absolute decoupling. And, uh, you know, this is the uh, CO2 concentrations versus all of the different conferences still going up, in fact, at ever higher rates. In principle, a superorganism could be super intelligent, but ours is not. In the 1930s, economists chose GDP as a metric to track economic activity, not as an end goal. Almost 100 years later, our economies unconsciously, relentlessly pursue the GDP carrot often toward frivolous endeavors that promise the greatest financial return in the shortest time. Okay, no one's driving this societal bus, not politicians, billionaires, a secret cabal. We're all caught in this global growth imperative, which is immune from self-criticism. Um, and uh, yeah, so the emer so climate change and the ocean risks, uh, they're all, they're all artifacts of, of, uh, of they're all, consequences of our super organism you know population still rising but it is slowing uh, renewable energy is building you know the super organism is still growing the super organism it doesn't voluntarily shrink okay so we have to change economic systems before we can decarbonize the economy even the switch from wood to coal wasn't a transition it was only an addition you know, renewables are adding energy, but they're not replacing hydrocarbons. They continue to scale. CO2 continues to go up. Um, and uh, the extraction of natural resources, the, uh, between 1970 and 2010, estimated total, total global extraction of natural resources from Earth, fuels, ores, salts, biomass, etc. It grew 3.2 times from 22 to 70 billion tons. The size of the world economy grew 3.4 times. For one additional unit of gross world product, we needed close to one additional unit of natural resources. If we remain at 17 terawatt, we still need a kilogram of minerals for every $2 of global GDP. Physics suggests that this is not possible. Okay, so, and here's, uh, you know, the credit and financialization, which is a complete uh, artifact. It's just a human creation, the credit. This is total domestic credit versus GDP. So GDP is still growing, but credit is growing much, much faster. In fact, three and a half, oh, more than three and a half times faster. So here's where we're heading. This is the non-renewable resources. This is the money, the credit. Uh, this is the, we're at X and we're trying to reach Y, but instead we're going to head, we're going to, plummet over to Z and back even down. This is a great simplification. Uh, it has to happen based on energy. It's unavoidable, unavoidable, right? Unless, you know, maybe if we just went completely nuclear and had nuclear plants everywhere, we could prolong it. But, you know, our, our, our biosphere is collapsing. Okay, and there's a lot of social traps, denialism, nihilism, you know, uh, things that make us uncomfortable, we don't want to think about. The major problems in the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and the way people think. Good quote. When a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence have the capacity to shift the entire system. Well, that's good. What's next? Predictions for the superorganism. We can't precisely predict the future, but we can be confident of what won't happen. So we've been kicking the can down the road. What, what is very unlikely to happen, 
We can't grow the global economy while simultaneously solving climate change, reducing CO2, and avoiding a sixth mass extinction. Growing the economy while replacing hydrocarbons with low carbon energy, we can't, we can't do that. You know, hydrocarbons are growing as renewables are growing. Voting on mass to keep remaining carbon in the ground, we can't do that. Right, society is going to collapse. Civilization is going to collapse. Leaders embracing or preparing for an end of growth before it happens. None of them are. When when the end of growth happens, everybody's going to be surprised. Oh, what happened? Oh my God, we never saw this coming. Well, really, come on. Um, with the backdrop of the super superorganism, we might make some predictions. As more people recognize that energy underpins our futures, we'll witness more schemes focusing on gross energy as opposed to its net contribution to society. Many technologies will be promoted that are viable, but not relevant, affordable, and scalable. We'll continue to create money or credit, expecting their abundance to overcome physical world problems until they reach to reach limits and the whole thing comes tumbling down. To avoid social instability, we'll remediate wealth inequality via programs like universal basic income, um, things like that. Um, these trans, you know, so we'll probably do that. As economic prospects deteriorate, people will foster group cohesion. They'll blame their problems on outgroups and tend to vote for leaders who promise better economic futures or things like the past, return to the past like Trump's, Bolsonaro's, Matteo, Le Pen's, Morrison's, okay? Um, as the US and Brazil attest, one of the few remaining economic cans to kick is deregulation and removal of environmental protection. As the economy gets worse, environmental initiatives like climate mitigation will become less popular, not because people disbelieve or care less, but because they'll have less financial and emotional bandwidth to advocate for them. As a globally tethered economic system, we'll likely do anything we can to kick the can further down the road. We're caught in a spiral of growth, limits to growth, response to limits, more growth, more limits, more response. Okay, uh, we'll have to do things differently. And this goes into it, um, you know, right now we're ecologically functioning as a mindless energy dissipating structure. We could overcome this, but will we? Um, we've been, humans have unwittingly been ensnared in the carbon trap. To maintain our lifestyle and existence, we have to continue burning the ancient carbon that's destroying the natural world. We're all complicit. We need to retire our 500 billion strong fossil armies. If we really did this, it would transform our way of life in ways we're likely to resist. Okay, so we need to physically and psychologically prepare for circumstances with less credit, complexity, less energy, material throughput. We'll need social support structures for those falling off the treadmill. We need a science linked blueprint describing how a new economic system based on the biophysical reality might emerge from this great simplification. There you go, the great simplification. So, so you know, I love this passage here. A bunch of mildly clever, highly social apes broke into a cookie jar of fossil energy and we've been throwing a party for the past 150 years. The conditions at the party are incompatible with the biophysical realities of the planet. The party is almost over. When morning comes, radical changes to our way of living will be imposed. Some of the apes must sober up before morning and create a plan that the rest of the party goers will agree to. But mildly clever, highly social apes neither easily nor voluntarily make radical changes to their way of living. And so coffee and stimulants, credit, etc. will be consumed during another lavish breakfast, but with the shades drawn, it's morning already. It's likely that in the not too distant future, the size, complexity, and literal burn rate of our civilization will be much reduced by forces other than human volition. We're not going to plan this outcome. We have to, we could react to it with airbags, social cohesion, and ethos, prepared blueprints based on intelligent and wise foresight, but, but it's not happening. There's no sign of it happening. So we're going to hit all these bottlenecks. Okay. Um, can we tap 
into our wiring for group cooperation to align ourselves with a purpose beyond turning trillions of barrels of fossils into microliters of dopamine. <laughs> okay, so ecological eco economics has been around about 30 years, but um, it hasn't been implemented, of course, um, and uh, it's going to be the way of the future. So anyway, thank you for listening. Fascinating paper. Nate Hagens uh, was with the Post Carbon Institute. Uh, a couple things about him. He basically with the Post Carbon Institute, Bottleneck Foundation, Institute for the Study of Energy in the Future. He was lead editor of the Oil Drum before. Um, he's a public speaker, um, director of the Institute for the Study of Energy in Our Future. Um, and there's, you know, lots of stuff. He's talked about the great simplification. There's a podcast of that title. Um, there's a movie, The Great Simplification. Um, and uh, there's, uh, you know, this is his YouTube channel. Lots of, you know, recent videos. Um, I haven't watched them myself, but I'm told that they're well worth watching. Uh, this is the Earth Trust, a group that is that he's being involved with, I believe, too. And uh, this is the Institute for Integrated Economic Research. And they have a true energy and carbon statistics. This is something from a couple years ago that they put out. So he's got the credentials. He's a very interesting guy. And, uh, you know, he wrote a fascinating paper a few years ago, which is, uh, you know, it's right on the mark. Energy is everything. We've got to get away from this addiction to now. Thanks for listening, and uh, please consider donating at my PayPal on my website, paulbeckwith.net. Thanks again, and bye for now. It's getting dark, so I've gone on for too long. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.